Um, first, Sheila Foster, Joint Professor of Law and Public Policy at Georgetown University, co-director of the International Laboratory for the Governance of the Commons. And following her will be Andrea Reimer, former two-term city councillor for Vancouver and currently a Loeb Fellow at the Graduate School of Design in Harvard. Would you welcome, please, Sheila and then Andrea. Well, good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm going to, um, once I get my notes open, sorry about that, I'm going to speak a little bit about our work at LabGov um, and start with a broad idea that shapes our work to innovation. And that is the idea that um, the city is a shared resource, sorry, um, or rather a common, sorry, I'm messing this up. Thank you. That the city is a commons, a common good. Um, and by that we mean that cities are, by their very nature, open and often welcoming places where all kinds of people come to create and recreate their lives using the physical and social and economic and cultural resources that are uniquely found in cities. In his groundbreaking work about the development of the city of Chicago, historian William Cronin writes of Chicago in the 19th um, century that Chicago was formed out of a cityless landscape by people who migrated there and created the city through cultural and economic exchanges. He says, by using the landscape, by giving it names and calling it home, people selected the features that mattered most to them and drew their mental maps accordingly. Once they labeled these maps in a particular way, natural and cultural landscapes began to shade and reshape into each other. So in this way, great cities are constructed, shaped, and reshaped by the people who migrate and inhabit them. So thinking of the city as a commons is a way to acknowledge that the city is generative, capable of providing for different social and economic needs of its population. And thinking of the city as a commons is a way to stake a claim to the fact that the city consists of many tangible and intangible resources that differently situated individuals and communities depend on to meet a variety of their needs, both to survive and to flourish. But we also think that thinking of the city as a commons is a way to imagine the city as an infrastructure or a platform on which we can share resources, collaborate together to co-produce and co-govern a variety of urban goods and services ranging from environmental, cultural, knowledge, and digital resources supported by open data and technology, so we've just heard about smart cities, and guided by principles of justice. And so it provides a framework for us to um, understand the ways that, in fact, communities are already working together and collaborating with public officials and civil society and sometimes the private sector to both protect resources from enclosure in cities, but also to co-create and co-produce new resources. So we have this project um, rooted in this idea of the city as a commons um, and based on our own more than a decade long investigation and experimentation in drafting policies and working with communities in various uh, cities, starting in the city of Bologna, uh, but also now in Amsterdam, Turin, New York, Baton Rouge, Accra, Sao Paulo, and San Jose, Costa Rica. It's part of what we call the Co-Cities Project. And um, what we've been doing is surveying and mapping over 100 cities around the world and over 200 projects within them that have been co-created or co-produced and have identified a number of examples of collaboratively governed housing, wireless or, or, um, or broadband networks, energy microgrids, and other essential services and social infrastructure that often emerge actually in economically and socially fragile communities trying to transform some of the infrastructure of the city, be it abandoned or vacant lots or, or vacant buildings, and even entire neighborhoods into livable and affordable communities by working with city officials and others to regenerate or stabilize communities through tools like land trusts and other regulatory innovations. Um, so what we've done is try to identify um, 
principles or characteristics that shape these experimental projects and policies um, that end up into a variety of institutionalized cooperation between public community and civil actors that foster social innovation and urban services provision, um, including, again, community gardens, um, urban farms, um, whole urban villages that are put into land trusts, or broadband networks that are shared and co-governed by communities, and that these um, spur collaborative economies as a driver of local economic uh, development and promote, and promote inclusive urban regeneration. So some of the principles that we've identified are reflected on the screen. Um, we've observed that these projects and policies often um, are collectively governed by what we call a quintuple helix of actors, right? So the quintuple helix idea is from innovation studies and it suggests that you need a number of actors here, public authorities, social innovators, civil society organizations, knowledge institutions like universities, local businesses um, that come together and what we call pool their efforts, knowledge, and resources to generate new goods and to enhance the capacity for co-creation and co-governance of these goods and services. Um, so in this way, we're mixing and matching urban resources across the city to expand the capacity of those resources, and in fact, the city as a whole, often the city administration. In public authorities, the city plays an important, what we call, enabling role um, in facilitating and empowering these forms of collaborative action and governance of shared urban assets, often through legal innovation and the transfer of resources of various types, sometimes financial, sometimes technical, and sometimes actual land. We've also observed, in line with the last discussion, that digital infrastructure and platforms um, are off in enabling, um, an enabling driver of cooperation and co-creation. They allow participants and, um, and residents to come together. Um, and those that normally may not engage in um, other or other processes of public participation. Um, and often they intentionally or consciously seek to overcome the digital divide. So this is what we call tech justice. And finally, the presence of these policies and enabling mechanisms are often experimental and adaptive. That is to say that they're very place-based. They don't look the same in every context, although we can um, sometimes learn from um, uh, one context and apply it to another, but, in, but, but, but they often need to take into account the variation and complexity of urban environments. So these principles capture the variety of ways um, that we observe are present and that really instantiate the city as a commons, as a cooperative space, as a platform on which a number of actors can collaborate uh, to produce uh, very innovative forms of common goods and services. But we also know that uh, co-creating these spaces and these policies um, and these forms of urban goods and services is quite complex. Um, that is to say that um, cities are increasingly not just congested, but heavily regulated and also an increasingly privatized space. So the process used to arrive at some of these projects and policies um, can't just be replicated, as I said before, in each place in the same way. So this is why, as part of our experimentation and study, uh, we're trying to codify and capture what we call the cycle or process of innovation. I'm not going to go through this now. I'll be on a panel in the next uh, session on regulatory innovation where I can talk more about this process. But this process uh, we've seen is often composed of six phases, uh, what we call cheap talking, mapping, practicing, prototyping, modeling, and then testing. Um, so again, I'll talk about this later, but just to end, uh, there are many examples, and we're going to hear from, um, from the next speakers um, about particular ones uh, that demonstrate that co-creation and co-governance and co-production 
of urban goods and resources that truly meet the needs of many communities, including those that are the most vulnerable in our cities, um, is not a, um, a rare phenomenon. Um, and so we hope to continue to capture these examples, to write about them, and to show that co-creation can help cities transition to a more inclusive and resilient future um, in ways that meet the needs of diverse communities. Thanks so much. Siem e Siaya, um, Andrea Reimer, Kui Ansana, Ansolaten, Tena Chen Tala, East Vancouver, uh, Chinquinman Ta Huron Winda, e Ta Peton First Nations, e Ta Seneca, and e Ta Mississaugas of the Credit River, Ohomeho. Kuisots to Anz Haichka. So good morning, everyone. My name is Andrea Reimer, and I was um, offering my Thanks to the local Indigenous nations in the language of the Indigenous nation from my home, which is Vancouver. Um, I'm a recently former three-term city councillor. I was wondering if I should correct Mary on that, um, but I actually got a lot done in that third term, so I didn't want to totally erase it. Um, I'm also a, currently not living in Vancouver, but in Boston, where I'm a Harvard Fellow on um, Urban Policy and Democracy. And it's a pleasure to join you here today and to spend a little time back in Canada. Uh, so you heard from Sheila the framework, uh, and my job today is to introduce you to three cities that are animating it, although that's definitely not my slide. So can someone tell me, oh, there we go. Okay, so let's go back one second here. Uh, so I'm going to start somewhere I know well, which is the city of Vancouver, which in 2009 set a goal to be, uh, amongst other things, the greenest city in the world by the year 2020. So in 2010, um, I met with the Lord Mayor of Copenhagen, Frank Jensen, at his request, uh, as I was the lead councillor on our work to be the greenest city. Um, at the time, for context, Copenhagen was the greenest city in the world, so you can imagine what I thought the content of our meeting might be about. Uh, but what he did was sit down across from me and we explained some presentries, um, one of which was him saying, we are so very impressed with Vancouver. And I thought, I mean, this is like sitting across from Elvis and having him say, wow, you're a really good guitar player. Um, at the time, we were sub 500th um, greenest city in the world, and the Danes were first. Uh, but he said, no, I'm not just being polite. Um, what I found out from him was that Copenhagen at the time had no partnerships, not a single external partnership with anything other than themselves. I was astounded because every single thing that we had been doing up to that point on the Greenest City had to involve a partnership. It wasn't the only thing we were doing on Greenest City, because um, I, I don't want you to take the message away from this that as long as you have partnerships, everything was okay. Uh, like Copenhagen, we had a leader, a mayor, um, a leader who led, not just a small L leader, but a capital L leader, Gregor Robertson, our mayor up until Monday. Uh, we had a plan with clear metrics. Um, we had a saying that some is not a number and soon is not a time. So we had a plan that clearly laid out the timelines by which we would meet certain quantifiable goals and a bylaw that requires annual reporting out on that. Uh, we also did action. Um, we had 50 plus actions already underway before we even passed the plan, which created momentum, hope for what a fully developed plan might look like, and also credibility that it would be achieved. Um, but none of it actually would have been possible without the collaborations. Just in the consultation phase alone, we had over 35,000 residents and 180 different organizations that represented half a million Vancouverites involved in building the plan. And as I said earlier, every single action resulted from either internal cross-departmental collaboration, an external partner, or partners, and often all of the above. It sounds super brilliant after listening to Sheila, like we thought this all up as some grand plan, um, but there was actually a really very simple reason for us doing all that. Um, you may remember in 2010, the Prime Minister of Canada was not particularly friendly to the concept of green cities, in fact, was quite hostile to our particular approach to it. Uh, and at the provincial level, they were better, um, but there was a big gap between 
good on green and better than the national government at the time. So here we are on the edge of the country, a relatively small city with a tiny legislative jurisdiction and even tinier fiscal capacity. If we wanted to get anything done, we had to do it through partnerships. Copenhagen, in contrast, is a wealthy city with the national government completely aligned on their goals. They have a very strong fiscal capacity relative to Canadian cities. Um, I'll say that because Adam's here and maybe he can take that message back to his government, and an even stronger legislative authority. They didn't think they needed partners at all, and in fact, didn't technically speaking, until they saw what it could do. So each of us had built the system we needed to succeed within our environment. We had an environment in Vancouver somewhat akin to the conditions that lead to Kenyans becoming marathon runners, and as a result, we moved from below 500th greenest city in the world to fourth or third, depending on which measurement system you use, and Copenhagen's position has stayed basically flat, although they were first, so it's hard to get better than that. Uh, so the second city I wanted to tell you about was Bogota, um, and why Bogota? Uh, Vancouver and Copenhagen are two cities in strong democracies with strong economies, so they perhaps don't present the broadest range of possibility for city. Um, Bogota is a city in a country with neither of those two things, yet it's accomplishing some really amazing uh, outcomes in economic, social, environmental, and cultural development. If you don't know about Bogota, it's in Colombia. It's a city of close to 8 million people. It's hard to get an accurate count because they have Five million of their residents are internally displaced people. So imagine that. Imagine having a city with five million refugees. Um, when I was there uh, in 2009, uh, they were officially documenting 1,000 new residents per week. So that's 55,000 per year, and that's the documented residents coming into the city. None of them come with housing or jobs, education, healthcare, transportation, or food. So enter the Bogota Urban Food Project. Their goal was to train 40,000 urban farmers, starting with 10,000 that they would directly train. Uh, and each of them would train four people, knowing it's really 1,000 that will end up training 40 each, right? It's not ever going to be spread out equally. They had partners in the botanical garden, which is where these seedlings are. And the botanical garden uh, provided seedlings, trained people on things like making soil. Uh, Bogota is on very clay ground, so there's no actual soil to grow things with these 40,000 people. Uh, they had to learn how to collect water and compact gardening techniques with recovered waste materials, uh, such as black plastic bags, which are very prevalent in Bogota. Community centers played a key role both in growing and providing training on cooking. The city was the coordinating body. And the funding came from the Japanese International uh, Cooperation Agency and many universities in Bogota, and many of them were involved. But the most important partners were the farmers themselves. They had neighborhood captains who had morning meetings with every urban agriculturalist that had been trained in their community. They're farming in very difficult conditions. Um, I was actually there to receive an award uh, for Vancouver's work on urban agriculture. I talked to them a bit about the context of Vancouver, which included housing prices. Hard to talk about Vancouver without housing prices. When I finished my presentation, the first question was, if land is so expensive, why are you gardening on the ground? Uh, this bean pole provided beans for four families from a 118 hole inch in the ground. And everything they were doing was about how to maximize space. So although I went to receive an award from them, I actually left learning a lot from them and what they were able to do bringing partners together and mobilizing 40,000 people to feed themselves and gain incomes for their family. So the last example I wanted to give you was Barcelona. They don't have quite as big a challenges as Bogota but some significant economic challenges resulting from the global recession. They have the added challenge of being in Catalonia, and as much focus is put there on independence politics as on the politics of economic justice. So the government in Catalonia, uh, which is the provincial level of government, chose to rebuild the economy of Barcelona through tourism, which may sound okay, but they uh, brought in a lot of tourisms, tourism, but built no new hotel rooms. So the result of this is that they uh, basically evicted tens of thousands of people in, uh, through the use of Airbnbs in the city of Bar Barcelona, hence these stickers um, all over Barcelona. And people were now making tourism wages, so their ability to economically compete for other housing 
uh, was very low. Enter Barcelona en Camus, which is a made in Catalonia model of the Patemos crowdsourced government. They build a platform by, uh, through residents who combed the world looking not for best practices, they're not interested in best practices because they see them as a ceiling, but edge practices. What haven't we thought of yet? They brought all those policies together and then voted on those uh, collectively and ran candidates willing to back those edge practices. They weren't willing to stop there though. At the halfway point of their term in government, they decided to convene a conference called Fearless Cities with all the people who informed the original document from around the world and launched a global movement seeking a way to create a global platform for cities trying to push out the edges of what is possible. It is a complete peer-to-peer -peer network, not just in content, but in the way they do their work. This is lunch, uh, it's community paella cooked by conference attendees, and all the logistics, accommodations, and organizing were similarly accomplished, not to make registration cheaper for some attendees, but it because it didn't cost anything to attend, but because their mission to them is as important at the, as, uh, is as much about the process as it is about the outcome. The result of this is the largest and strongest peer-to-peer -peer municipal movement on the planet right now. Progressive mayors in different contexts come together to learn from each other, but most importantly to work together to find where those new edges are. Unique because it's about meeting local needs, but it also has its eyes set on a much larger goal, and that is the rising wave of right-wing nationalists. So given, I'm going to give the last word to the mayor of Acuna, uh, sorry, Acarunia in Spain. His uh, name is Mayor Julio Ferriero. He says, connected, inclusive cities are the best weapon we have against fear and barbarity. We need cities for everyone. Thank you.